Good morning, David. Thank you for joining us. Uh, it's certainly a pleasure to have you here in this series I'm working on about providers and telehealth. Uh, for those folks out in the audience, uh, please know David and I go way back. Uh, we worked together on DWI programs in Western North Carolina and uh, some of the challenges uh, related particularly to geography and things of that nature uh, that we experienced back in the late 70s, early 80s are still very much uh, alive and unfortunately well in, in rural mountain areas such as back then beepers didn't work and certain parts couldn't get a signal through, David, as you'll remember. And still to this day, uh, because our nationwide infrastructure doesn't provide broadband service uh, as it should to all of our citizens, there are still places you can't get a uh, signal for uh, sufficient for telehealth in Western North Carolina. But I'm not going to do a whole lot of introduction, as I told David, but it is my pleasure to have uh, David Swan joining us today. Uh, unlike the previous three uh, providers that have participated in this series, uh, they were all providing specific telehealth services directly to clients. David's role in his company has been more along the lines of helping providers provide those services uh, in both a nuts and bolts sense and how to do it properly, as well as in a much more macro vision of uh, looking at policies and procedures and things of that nature. So uh, David, again, uh, let me welcome you to uh, my YouTube channel and this series on providers and telehealth. And I ask you just to give us a, a quick uh, bio of your experience and how you kind of came into this position. Certainly. Well, thank you, Cecil. It's very good to be with you today and uh, good to uh, be able to help uh, all the viewers that uh, of your YouTube channel. Um, I'm a product like you uh, of a lifelong community mental health uh, person here in North Carolina, and uh, it has been my full career. And um, and uh, and at the same time, in the last uh, 25 years of it, I started doing some small amount of consulting on the side uh, with a friend of mine um, who started MTM Services. And, um, and uh, so over the years, um, I became more of an integral part of that group. And when I, um, when I was considering retirement, uh, then I became more of a part of that. And it was always in the plan for me to land in that consulting firm uh, in retirement. And I did retire in 2014. So as you said, Cecil, we started off doing clinical work together. And then as I moved um, further east, but never out of the mountains, uh, and uh, so still, still in the mountains, where that you and I were bred, and where where that we feel the most comfortable in our beautiful state, um, uh, the work that I did became uh, more organizational and administrative, and I rose to be the chief executive of one of the uh, larger community mental health programs, and then um, rose to lead one of the managed care organizations in North Carolina that um, started off in. Uh, um, uh, 2004, uh, and we had to divest of those clinical services, as you recall, and as most people who are familiar with North Carolina. So I did have to separate from that work um, directly, but um, indirectly, I still kept my hand in it and uh, now do so today. Uh, MTM Services is a national consulting firm for behavioral health. I do primary care work, I do hospital work, I do managed care work, but it's mostly focused on behavioral health provider organizations uh, in the nationwide. And we're affiliated with the National Council for Mental Wellbeing that most people might be uh, well aware of, also out of Washington, D.C. Great. And one of the things I'm really looking forward to with, with uh, you today and getting your uh, wisdom on, our previous three uh, providers have like me have been almost restricted to individual assessment and clinical services. My, my experience has been providing individual therapy via telehealth. I have not had the opportunity to do group therapy. 
Uh, and I know that's an area where you've developed some expertise in, and I appreciate you bringing that point of view. So could we, could you maybe share with us a little bit? I, I, we all went through Foreman, Storman, and Norman, or Foreman, Norman, and Storman, or, you know, whatever the proper order is there. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, setting group norms via tele, telehealth and how that may or may not even be different from uh, live face-to-face? Yeah, absolutely. Be happy to and um, and excited to actually. Um, so I'm just going to start though by saying something about the power of group. And so you you and I both know the power of group. We've done group therapy together. We know the power of this. And what has been discouraging to me is uh, hearing from professionals around the country who um, who don't feel like that they can use the power of the group in a telehealth platform. And uh, so I set out to say, no, 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 let's stop that conversation. And I had this little brief snippet of a story where that an organization in another state, not North Carolina, was um, doing a large conversion of four or 500 um, professionals over to telehealth pretty rapidly at the very beginning of the pandemic um, last um, late winter. And um, and so we were doing the service array building and, you know, so we got to the, all the group stuff and they were doing a phenomenally large amount. And I said, OK, let's work on let's moving that over to telehealth. And one of the most senior clinical people uh, in the in this large group of professionals in a Zoom meeting, just like we're having here today, um, uh, said to me um, with everybody else listening, well, you don't expect that the same quality can be delivered via telehealth and group that you can in person, do you? And I just paused and everybody did. And I said, uh, uh, yes, I do say that that can happen. And so it's just such a firm belief. So I'm pretty dogmatic about that. So I kind of start with that as a norm, that the norm is, is that groups have power and they, they, they exercise power way more than you and I can individually. And we know how to unleash some of that. You know, from the old Irving Yalin books that we used to study, you know, in graduate school um, about how we can get momentum going and how that actually um, uh, one of our you, our old supervisors and mentors used to say, don't take away something from a person in a group that they can do themselves. And what that meant to me in group therapy was, is that if we take away um, that some of the power of a group and serve someone individually when the power could have been in their favor. And we have done them a disservice. So that's how I start with these kind of norms and these thoughts about, um, about what, what, what we have to do. So just talking about those norms, um, one of the first things that I want to say about that, given all that context, is that, is that every clinician uh, may not be the, you know, the best telehealth group facilitator, leader, clinician. And let me then add to that every client, um, it, you know, is not going to be the best client for uh, for group uh, services via telehealth. So I think where we get in trouble is that where the norms are that this is what we do. You know, we do group therapy for people with addiction. And so everybody goes into the group and we don't customize this for people. And we don't think about the customization for the clinicians. And I think that is a norm that we've got to bust up. We can't assume that that's the case. Um, so I'm, a, and now you, and you did a nice job of talking about the macro and organizationally, kind of the way I influence people now in organizations. So what I encourage, I encourage credentialing. Uh, credentialing for the clinicians like you and I. So how would we become credentialed to be a group clinician using telehealth? Well, I think there's two skill sets. There's a skill set on group therapy, which I know you have, number one. And then there's another one, and that's the skill set of telehealth. And just because you and I are doing this today and our appearance and how we are viewed on the screen and how we interact, our eye contact, um, you know, with the camera, all of that are part of what I call the telehealth etiquette and being able to bring out the best, the healing of people uh, via, uh, via use of telehealth. So I think there's two of the norms right there is that just don't assume that every client um, is, is, would be able to benefit from this and don't assume that every clinician is. And in fact, again, I've created policies and organizations that say, so you want to do telehealth. See, this was a real bugaboo last year is that because organizations were coming to me and saying, 
we got to move all 400 of our clinicians into telehealth mode because that's the way we're going to do it. We can't put everybody together. And I said, I mean, the whole question was, what if, what if David Swan can't do it? They said, we don't want to hear that. <laughs> don't want to hear that. See, so they weren't willing to accept that norm at first, but now we've matched, we kind of matured into this. So we need to, we need to understand that, I believe. So credentialing people and the professionals, I think is a good start of saying, this is the norm. We're going to say as an organization that Cecil and David are credentialed to do this, or they're going to say David is not because I can't demonstrate that. And, you know, and so there's a, there's this testing phase. Maybe there's a, um, there's a, like a training module. Maybe there's a YouTube video, Cecil, that we could watch, you know, yeah. to gain some skills about that. Um, so that those are some of the things that I would start off with. Um, the next thing about this is the whole informed consent. So, so, um, so what I craft for organizations is a real specific informed consent around the use of telehealth, explaining all of the risk. So, and I have a tremendously large number of stories. Here's another one from just like three or four months ago where somebody wrote into their informed consent for telehealth before I got to it, that there is no difference between telehealth and any other types of mental health treatment or addiction treatment, and, you know, in the, in the whole risk. And I said, hold on, <laughs> you've got to, I mean, just watch the news that, you know, hacking, we all learned if you have an iPhone, uh, I've got one on the floor over here. Uh, we all learned last night, you know, from the news, from the national news, we got to do this update. I mean, this is this is something that we have to inform people of. And, you know, Cecil, when you and I started years ago, we never had to worry about people bringing a cell phone into the group room and, and bringing right. it up and snapping a picture, yeah. you know, but now you got to be concerned about that yeah. in a group that's in person. Right now, I could press my print screen and I could take a picture of you and I right now. And if we were all in a group bound by confidentiality, I could take a picture of everybody's face and I could share that. So, yeah, so we have to have informed consent and then we have to have protections that I call the kind of the group therapy telehealth cl uh, contract um, that the clients bind themselves to us and to the group um, on what they're what they're able to commit to. Um, so those are some of those kind of norms. Um, one more thing that I think is really important, and that is um, kind of this norm of orientation to a telehealth group. Um, I, I still recall you and I have discussions about this possibly 38, 37 years ago about orienting people and how that maybe they might do better in group if we oriented them about, you know, what to expect and kind of what it is. I think this is what we need to do also about orientation, but this time we need to take different kind of things into, into mind. Do they have the right technology? Um, you know, can they, uh, have they practiced using what we're doing right now? Uh, to be able to, uh, to be able to participate in a group. So to orient them, I would encourage that to be individual, but virtual so that we can practice using their virtual. So you want to start it up and you want to show them how to get into, if you're using Zoom or some of those other platforms, how do we invite them into the waiting room? And then how do we invite them into the group? Right. And, and then kind of norms of like attendance. I remember we talked about this many times years and years yes. ago too, yeah. and uh, about, and about like the timeliness. Um, so um, uh, you know, one of the things when you're doing a live group is that, you know, let's say you have 12 members in your group and you have one person out at the front desk and you have 12 people coming in to check in all at the same time, you'll see my macro level work here on these norms. And so, so this norm, we used to have the norm of getting people in about 20 minutes ahead of time, uh, before the group starts so that if the front desk takes two minutes per group member, that's 24 minutes in order to check someone in, collect the copayment and do all that stuff. So now, how do we do it online? Uh, we have to work through a process of that and that can be covered in the orientation. And we also, um, I usually suggest we set a five minute after the group is supposed to start. So group starts at nine and 9.05 kind of deadline. You need to be in the group and seated and ready, you know, to really do that. A whole lot of things kind of go into that process of um, giving people and clients the instruction what to wear. It, pretty much what we say is that, in, and we put it in the contract, you wear what you would have worn to the office. If you were going to come in person, what would you wear? Yeah. No sitting I, or I laying. Make, I make the point, why, why should I dress like I'm going to the office? And the answer is because you're going to the office, even though you're right. sitting in front of a camera at home. That's right. You know, and, I, and I think and I to think be so, aware of what that camera shows. Too. Yeah, it, it, these are part of the norms, you know, yeah. that 
that are just different now than they than they, than they actually were. Um, interesting. Uh, one of the coachings I did not too long ago was for a psychiatrist doing um, uh, doing um, partial hospitalization group treatment from his home in North Carolina to a partial hospital adolescent girls group. Talk about interesting. Um, <laughs> so, so, so all of these norms, see, and I, I think they're customized a little bit for different, you know, scenarios. And I think that one I had to, I had to do some customization for that. Yeah. You know, it was, it was different about what, um, what the clients wanted to wear, what they were doing, what they were, you know, where they wanted to be at. Right. Uh, the whole privacy, it's another one of those things that the privacy, you have to be able to get the clients to guarantee that they are in a room in a place that nobody else is at and you have to make them commit to not allowing anybody else in. We've had um, some breaches of this and that becomes sort of the, the big uh, problems, you know, where that if somebody were over here in my office right now and out of your sight and quiet, they could hear everything that we could say and, and also see my screen. And, um, you know, there's just too much of, of this, that this has to be covered in all the norms. Right. So this is a part of that orientation. And there's, there's a laundry list of these things that I usually put into like one of those agreements. And so I have the clinicians go through that with the individual clients in that orientation setting, which usually takes about 30 to 45 minutes. So I think this is I, what I would call this um, in the addiction treatment world is the readiness for change. Mm. is that I am assessing, okay. I'm doing an ASAM. <laughs> I'm uh, yeah. assessing uh, dimensions, is that dimension four, I think dimension three mm. or four. I actually do a little bit of that readiness assessment, you know, with them. And then I give them instructions and guidance. Now I'm a, um, you know, I, I teach organizations how to use DocuSign. So, you know, so I could send you the client in right. this fashion, that document, and you could sign it and then you send it back to me. Yeah. So I, those I, are some I of those. Nitro PDF. Yeah, Same I could probably process. go on and on, but yeah, I'll right. let you pause for questions. <laughs> okay. Well, I wanted I, I wanted a specific scenario uh, to address uh, when I, I did a training recently for the state uh, state of North Carolina uh, DWI services section, and one of the participants asked me a question about hybrid group therapy via, via telehealth. And she was referencing uh, people who are attending the same group via telehealth and people live in her group room together. And she was saying, how do I improve and make that uh, camaraderie, that group cohesion come together in that scenario? And I, unfortunately, I mean, I. I had no idea. I still don't have yeah. any idea uh, how one pulls that off, but I wanted uh, to ask that of you and get your thoughts on it. I, I know my response to her was more based on if everybody was in a group and uh, hot, just the telehealth and you can, I know you in Zoom and I'm at, I think now in Google Meet, you can put people in rooms so you have yeah you know, some randomization options or assignments if you want to do small group activities. But that really doesn't address that person that's live mm -hmm. and that person that's in television. So yeah. Have you got any specific thoughts? Uh, around I do. That? I do. And, I, and I, I've actually had that question a number of times. I'm thinking about um, an organization on the on the West Coast that wanted to do it, started doing it and had similar experiences to the person who asked you that question that it, they didn't feel confident with it. It wasn't going as well as they wanted to. And um, uh, so generally, I think that it gives um, the clients an unlevel field of treatment opportunity. So some people are in person. And as you and I started this morning, I said to you, I wish I was right with you in your office. I, I mean, for, for me, that would be better than what we're doing right now because I enjoy being in the same room with you. So if you have clients that get to be supportive of one another in that way, what you'll see <clears throat> is the people that are in the room together in person will, will favor the support and the understanding and they will pick up nuances that the rest of us would not be able to do 
Um, so, uh, so when I teach the clinical skills about this, like to a clinician, I'll say, so, so you're, so you're looking at your group members and you got to keep your eyes going on everybody and you notice a reaction to the person, what you and I would have seen in the room, if you can pick that up, you know, online, then you, then, so here's what we can say in a video is that we could say, see, so I just noticed that your, you know, your shoulders did this or something like that. Um, did you want to say something about that, whatever that would happen to the prompt, or did you have a reaction to something that someone said? Now I could do that in person, but even, but, but I'm going to be more precise on that in person than I would be on video because I, I, I like don't know. So I'm going to, so the, so the skill I teach is test it out with Cecil, see if there was, and Cecil said, no, nah, it was just, it was a fly on my shoulder. <laughs> I was trying to get that fly off. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no problem. You know, or in my but, case, I felt the hair grow, but yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> you and I both. <laughs> so, so it's what's um, so I, th I think I think that unlevel playing field creates a problem between and among clients. And so it's for that reason that I discourage it. Um, and if you can avoid it, I discourage it now so that you'll have people you'll have clinicians that will say, well, but I want to um, I want to um, let, let's just make it wh where it's go where where America is right now. You have a group of 12 people and six of them are vaccinated and six of them are not. And the vaccinated are okay with being with vaccinated people, but not okay with being with unvaccinated people and vice versa. Well, <laughs> you know, so you so you have these kind of divides that are gonna, you know, that are gonna make the group unstable, I would say. And it's gonna break up some of the power of the group. The power of the group is that, you know, <laughs> we both are wearing two or three button polo shirts. I mean, you know, we're going to be more alike. I'm going to, if you, well, here's what we used to say about, you know, particularly like addiction treatment groups. When, when I hear something from someone else that sounds like my story, healing begins. So if we interrupt that in any way, I think it can be non-productive. So my encouragement to organizations and to people like the uh, person who asked you the question is to avoid it if you can. And, to, uh, and so what you would say is that if you, if you have people that want to be in person and you have people that want to be, um, you know, online, then you might have a policy that says for the period of time right now, all of our group services are going to be virtual and online. So then, see, there's a there's a macro right there. That's a, that's a policy perspective that says this is the way we do our work. You remember us talking about that years ago? We, we used to say that to get families in. We used to say that to get people to adopt to our norms, which which we had adopted at the organization we work for to get the best care possible. So this is what I would I, I've, I've been encouraging people to do. I think I think it just um, it just breeds that kind of unhealthiness about whether some people might make good progress and some people may not. Right. And it, as you say that, uh, I had two thoughts. Uh, one on let me call it the micro level of, of being in that chair as that provider and knowing that just the the vehicle the platform of telehealth really makes us rely on all the cognitive uh, skills in a heavier way uh, than if we were in live situation where we could use all of our senses and the studies uh, i know it particularly came out of stanford university talks about Zoom fatigue and how yeah. that cognitive overload on providers uh, is so much greater in mm -hmm. the telehealth. So, so that, you know, that was one thing I, I was aware of as you were saying that. And the other was uh, wanting to say, well, let's step it up a notch. You know, I'm, I'm the provider and, and let's say, unlike me, who's in private practice and can, you know, I can set my policies basically. Uh, Let's pretend, and I don't know the answer to this, but I, my impression was the person asking that question was in an agency and therefore had someone above that had probably set 
this policy of we're going to do hybrid groups. And so that to me, that kind of begins to bring in that macro vision yep. that, that I know you've got expertise in. So let me, let, let's, let's role play, David. Yeah. Let's, let's pull We've out. We've never done that before, have we? <laughs> no, never, never. Okay. So you got to pretend I, I'm whoever that person was. And I'm saying, hey, I'm stuck. I'm in the middle of this. My boss tells me I got to do it, but I know I'm yeah. not doing a good job at it. It's, yeah. It's not right. What do I do, David? <laughs> well, you know, you can you can try to make the case, but you know, one of the one of the vulnerabilities is, is that if you say you can't do it, are you saying that you're not competent to do it? See, there's the there's the first thing about a about a about a clinical policy, and I would call that a clinical policy that is not based on the better care model. So, you know, um uh, that's people have kind of come to know me over the last um, almost 40 years now of that kind of talking better care. You know, I always just think that what is the better care? So here's the way that I might suggest you deal with your boss is that the first thing is to say, tell me how you believe that doing this hybrid model will lead to better care and better outcomes for our clients. I mean, so as the super person, you know, and you and I've been in those positions, a supervisor of something, you know, I, uh, you know, um, you know, and, and uh, I was always um, people oftentimes came to me as the chief executive trying to get me to make clinical policy when I had good people that could actually do that. But they knew that I had a little bit of a, of an instinct about some of these things. And and this is the, how I would suggest, you know, that, that you start a conversation about that. And I would probably get um, I would probably say you know, let's let's say that it was um, an administrator who had never been a clinician um, and who really didn't know was thinking about really the bottom line. If you if you don't allow people to do what they'll do, then you're not going to have a full group of 10 or 12 people. And then we can't afford to do this. So uh, we want to do what people want, essentially the whole demand process. Right. Um, if, if that if that's if that's what's driving it, then there I would hope that in the organization there's other clinical thinkers that can, that you can, you know, enlist in to talk about better care. How is this doing better care without saying that, that I am incompetent, that I can't do it. You know, remember I talked about credentialing. I would suspect that in an organization like what you just described, there may not be a credentialing policy that also says that just because of survivability, you're going to do telehealth, whether you can do it well or not. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, and 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 I think that's uh, that would be that would be another one of those mistakes. So it's it's really about what you know what kind of drives this. Um, uh, I um, uh, there's a formula that I would suggest that maybe people think about, and that formula would be number one, uh, it must make good clinical sense, and number two, and in these order, it must make good business sense. So I think we make the better care decision first, and the second phase that we do is going to be about the business case and you know if if uh if people um it, and it's kind of to contrary more people want to do tele um health than they do in person so i mean this, this is what we're seeing around the country there is a huge demand for it particularly of uh, people younger than us um this kind of younger generation the under 40 crowd would much rather be on the zoom like this than they would be in an office somewhere and, and it's much less kind of intrusive in their life and all of the barriers about transportation and childcare and everything that kind of gets in the way leaving work uh, all kind of go out the door when you make this more convenient and particularly, you know, in the evening um, or on weekends, sometimes like that. So I think that's just a, um, you know, a part of it. So, so if, if, you know, I think that's just the way that you probably start. Maybe I've, I've talked about it enough, but, but I, I just I just ask about, you know, is this going to be better care? And I think that's how I would start. Hmm. And I would have an intellectual conversation um, about about that, you know, so. Well, that's a great question. Is this better care? Um, and that should be from an ethics standpoint. We're all bound Correct. to do no harm, to that's provide right. the best professional care, care that we can. And so if that is one of our guiding principles, um, as a clinical supervisor, someone comes to me and says, hey, is this the best care? You know, I got to stop and think about that. 
uh, and be sure that I'm giving an appropriate answer because, right. you know, I mean, liability issues aside, uh, ethically, I need to be right. about promoting as a supervisor, not just promoting the policies and the procedures of the hierarchy of mm-hmm. ethics, but promoting good consumer care. So uh, your point is well taken. Your yeah. point also, I think, is a nice segue into uh, stepping it up yet another level. We've gone from provider to kind of mid-level supervisor policy procedure. And I know that you have contacts uh, on the national level now, and there's just a plethora of activity going on. And, and as you said uh, a moment ago, so many people are, are, are somewhere between, yeah, this is okay, and oh man, I love it. Yeah. Yeah. The, the June June 10th of uh, this year study uh, that came out of uh, a Harris poll, yeah. and 87 percent of the of the people that had had con- uh, telehealth services wanted to continue, uh, right. and that you know with a varying degrees of uh, percentage, but still all of them more so. Uh, Mm -hmm. than not, uh, people, consumers want to continue these services. I know my own limited subjective experience matches that. Uh, I've only had, really only had one person that was really adamant about it not happening. Uh, And that was during the height of COVID and there were Mm -hmm. too many risk factors. And so we came to some mutual understandings, but everyone else has no, no, I like this. This is this is beneficial. You know, yeah, I, this is much easier for me. So, you know, it's been positive. But let me let me throw the uh, ball back into your court. I'll go back to a sports metaphor here. Um, <laughs> balls back in your court. What what are would you forecast is uh, the national trends, and particularly post COVID, assuming <laughs> there will be a post COVID. Yeah. Well, I'd encourage um, all our viewers to Google some of this because um, you will see that um, that the post-COVID landscape for telehealth of all types seems to be so prominent, and there's a huge push. So there's a um, three or four kind of big things that are that are actually going on. One is that and this one is, is is so exciting; it's scary for me. When Medicare is a headlight and leads then I always take, I always pay special attention to that. <laughs> if Medicare gets out in front, because Medicare has kind of always been the caboose on the train, but when they're the engine and they're the headlight on this thing, to use another analogy, um, then I think this is amazing. So Medicare has come out and have been, has been one of the payers that has been so pro telehealth. And they did this before the pandemic, Cecil. So they started like three years ago. And they were it, all, I mean, it was almost like they were ready for this for people, um, you know, that are more mature and maybe, you know, on the Medicare um, Medicare uh, health plan, or maybe are dual eligible Medicaid and Medicare, some people who are disabled, you know. Um, this has just been an amazing thing. Now they still had some of those um, uh, rules that we didn't like, but with the pandemic, the rules were waived. And that, you know, the rule about that you, that you had to be in a, you know, in a HIPSA, you know, a health professional shortage area, uh, otherwise a rural health um, kind of clinic region, um, or, and you also had to receive the service at some medical practice somewhere, like an integrated health clinic or a mental health center or something like that. Uh, Those were the early days of what Medicare was like. So my point is, is that when you see the biggest um, unified and universal health plan in the country, to lead with this, that this is a striking thing to pay attention to, and we all should take notice about that. What what Medicare does, Medicaid follows. And so Medicaid is right there with it. Um, and uh, and then, um, you know, we were um, talking earlier before we got started this morning about all of the CPT codes. Now, the, the you know, the current procedural codes are owned by the, by, by the American Medical Association. The Hicks picks codes uh, are owned by the CMS. So we have these owners now saying something. So the AMA comes out in like April of 2020 with its big publication about telehealth, uh, telehealth saying, look, all of these CPT codes, we are saying, and we own them. 
So if we say something, then you, know, you also pay attention to this. We own them and you can do them with telehealth. And on the first page is the group therapy code. The first page. Also, let's be mindful, the family therapy codes, both with and without uh, the patient. So those things that you and I got started on, you know, a long, long time ago, these systemic treatments are now encouraged by the owners of the services themselves and then by the payers. So when we see this, this is just really starts this trend and there's this there's this momentum. So I, I, I think about this as forecasting, you know, um, you combine what I just said from what you just said, there is a demand for it by the consumers. There is now the the um, the governmental or controlling arms are saying we're not getting in the way of this. <laughs> we we really want this. What they've seen is 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 um, freer access to care. So today, and I I, I wanted to mention that um, I I have several organizations that come to mind right now in different states. One of them not too far from us in the great state of Tennessee. Um, that uh, that that has has nearly um, doubled their volume of care during the pandemic. So I had organizational clients that were going out of business being unsustainable because they couldn't turn the curve on telehealth last year. And I had organizations that were doing twice as much using telehealth last year and having their best sustainable year of operation in two decades. Uh, you know, so what, what's the secret sauce? The secret sauce is how we do it. I think we go back to what you just said a while ago. Better care has to drive this. And then we have to be good at doing it via telehealth. And we have to properly train people to make sure that we can do that. Some of the, I was wanting to say, I mean, some of the risks that I think that goes along with this when I talked about the norms of it's like a, like really specific examples is one bad technology event in a 90 minute group with one client of our 12. I'm using that as a magic number. I don't know which the groups are like of people that might view it, but you know, ours were always like eight to 10 people. So I'm just using 12 or so just to be out there. But um, whatever your size of group, if one client has a technology, blah, 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 whatever goes wrong and you're stuck with trying to fix something, it is it is going to disrupt everybody else in the group. So my, 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 my caution is, is that we can't let that happen. So we've got to do everything to prevent that. And the prevention is that orientation again and testing the technology. And, and then, um, you know, I get a lot of questions, those kind of unique things about like, so David, if I, I'm doing a group in person and I've got these clients and we have a crisis in the group, I know what to do, you know? Cecil's down the hall, I can call him, he'll come help me. I've got, I've got, uh, I've got support staff in the building. I've got whatever, you know, I, I, I kind of, and I know where people are, you know, I know where the client is, they're right in front of me. Now, 12 different homes, 12 different individual group members and a group. What do I do when someone, well, heaven forbid, let's say someone makes a suicidal threat in a right. group, which you don't have to do group for very long before something like that starts to happen, at least ideation or some talk about that, because we're, we're dealing with clients that think about those things and that have these kind of things as part of their symptom profile. Yeah. And so we have to know at every group session where the client is by an address. And we have to have that readily available on something so that if we need to do it, we can we can get somebody some help. Now, I also like um, uh, if, if, I, if I could control the whole thing, Cecil, to get this kind of better care stuff, I would like um, if I could uh, if I could if I could have the group leader always in an office where there's other professionals at so that I could make. So if it happened to me. I could call you, give you this address and say, this person's in a crisis, go take care of it for me. And I'm going to finish with this group so we don't lose the group. So we don't sacrifice the other 10 or 11 members. So you see those kind of things that I think we have to control for. And that's where that if, that if we don't do that, we, we then make these mistakes. Yeah. And, you know, you, you've, you're describing the scenario of emergency services. And in my credentialing as a nationally certified uh, telehealth provider, one of the key, key components was, hey, what's your emergency plan? And I, in doing the trainings I do, I try to make a big point of that. 
and, and again, better care. You know, it's in the consumer's best interest that we got a plan and that plan's in place before something happens. Uh, and, and I'm not sure where I was going with that, but, uh, oh, I do know it, it's not the consumer's responsibility. It's our responsibility as the provider and the God, you know, forbid something, the worst case scenario from the litigation standpoint. Uh, we're the ones culpable if yeah. we've not maintained and managed and reviewed and I hate to use the word documented uh, what that emergency plan is because you and I both know yeah if it ain't documented it, it, it happens <laughs> well and that that brings me to one of the things I wanted to get across and I said that maybe I could share my screen for just a yes. moment and uh, so I'll just I'll just click that. And um, the something that 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 I um, want our audience to understand is that um, generally the better and more measurable a goal and an objective is in the treatment plan, the better that the outcome may be already because we're going to be uh, having observable and measurable results and outcomes. So it this is even much more important when you're doing group therapy via telehealth. So having observable, measurable objectives. These are the milestones. These are on the way to a goal and they need to be reasonable for the clients. So this is the kind of coaching I give for every clinician that I may supervise or that I may be organizationally helping them to do a better job of it. But really, the, I think there's a, there's a slight difference in the service planning for group therapy when you're using telehealth. So you take your objective again, those smaller incremental things, and you want to make sure that there's going to be measurable change that is reasonable for the client. And this is what you're working on. So I think this is better. This is this is more manageable again uh, if we know where we're going when we're using telehealth. So this is where I think is a little bit. This is a skill set, I think, that, that people need. And you'll see those four kind of achievements down at the bottom that I that I coach people on. Is it going to be apparent to the client? So will they see themselves achieving an objective? Is it going to be meaningful to client to the client? You know, how is this going to be meaningful? So these are such small steps sometimes, but you want to make sure that it's meaningful. And how about in the reasonable amount of time can it be achieved? That's a big one for clients. They want to know that and that they want to know if telehealth maybe will slow them down or speed them up or, or the impact of just the whole delivery model. And then can this be uh, can this be assessed in an objective way, um, which kind of brings me to one of those things that I've been delving in lately, the last um, the last year and a half and particularly and I even I, I didn't want to forget um, how about what I'm supposed to use as the right language, but uh, oral fluid drug testing via telehealth. I'll say it again, oral fluid drug testing via telehealth. So see, organization said. We can't do this because we can't we can't do the drug testing like we need to do for let's say it's a court ordered you know person or somebody who's on probation or parole and and they're supposed to have periodic or random you know drug tests. Well, sure you can. <laughs> you know you get you get six of these oral fluid testing kits and you mail them to the client and the client has them at their home and on the telehealth. See what you you might not do this in a group. You could, but you know I don't always encourage that. But you might have you know a 15 minute um, ahead of time visit where we're going to do this oral fluid drug testing and we observe them to do it. See, this is much less invasive than the urine drug screening observations. I mean, this is oral fluid observations, so you can do it via telehealth and you see them open the package, you see them do the, take the test, you see them put it back in and you see them get it to the right processing. If it's not one of those rapid ones that you get it through the processing and then you go on to your group. And, and you have the results and these, these new testing devices are just, um, you know, they're just, they're, they're just a long shot from where you and I started again, 40 years ago. So there's so much, so, so much more technology out there, but just, just, you know, if one of the objectives, for example, is to, is to have, you know, three random, um, oral fluid drug screens that are negative, that's a real clear objective that can be easily assessed via via telehealth and we don't i i, I guess I, I want it overall i want people to see that telehealth 
does not produce a lot of the barriers that we think. You can get quality care. You can do drug testing. You can have good attendance and you can make good progress. But if you don't have good goals and objectives, then the progress may be a problem even in on in-person groups. So I'm just saying that really for telehealth groups, we have got to be really square on on this objective. Okay. I'll send Excellent. it back to you. Excellent. <laughs> well, David, we've come, we've come up on our, uh, what I'm assuming will be our time schedule here. Uh, this has been very instructive to me and uh, clarifying, and I, I'm, I'm confident that our viewers will uh, come away with new information. Uh, had I have known that you were going to do that on oral fluid testing, uh, I would have said, hey, and here's a webinar tip. <laughs> so let me say back after the fact, hey, here's a webinar tip for those of you who may not know you can do it. <laughs> but uh, David, uh, uh, just again, thank you so much for sharing your your time, your wisdom, your experience. It's been a pleasure to, to be with you uh, after quite a while. That's uh, right. Even if, even if it is telehealth, uh, I've enjoyed the opportunity and I, I look forward to more opportunity in the near future. So, As well uh, as I. Make sure the viewers click the subscribe button. <laughs> thank you. Hit that subscribe button and hit that notification bell wherever it is. <laughs> but please leave a comment too uh, as to what your thoughts were on this uh video and the content on, on all of them in the series, but uh, I know David will be checking in and if you leave him a question, hey, he might give you an answer. <laughs> but love David, to do it. Great. Thank you very much and uh, we'll, be, we'll close this out and give my best to Joy and, and again, hope to talk with you soon. And my best back to Kathy as well and I look forward to the next time. May you take good care. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.